It is a tremendous honor for me to welcome as our RIC keynote speaker, Mr. Rafael Mariano Grossi. Mr. Grossi has led the International Atomic Energy Agency as Director General since December of 2019 and, just a few days ago, in recognition of his leadership in conducting the agency with a visionary and courageous approach in challenging times. During his first term, the IAEA Board of Governors unanimously reappointed him for a second four-year term. Congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Grossi is a diplomat with over 35 years of experiences in the fields of nonproliferation and disarmament, having also served as ambassador of Argentina to Austria and the Argentine representative to the IAEA and other Vienna-based international organizations. Since the first days of the war in Ukraine, Mr. Grossi has worked tirelessly to focus IAEA's efforts to support Ukraine with ensuring nuclear safety and security of its nuclear facilities and radioactive materials, and he has provided regular updates on these efforts to the international community. He is a strong advocate for assisting IAEA member states to be prepared for new and advanced reactors. He consistently highlights peaceful uses of nuclear technology to meet the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. For example, his Rays of Hope initiative strives to bring critical cancer treatments to underserved areas. Mr. Grossi is an international gender champion and supports development of the next generation of youth in nuclear fields. Please join me in welcoming IAEA Director General Rafael Grossi. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and good morning to all. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, this conference is, of course, one of the reference points um, for the international uh, regulatory um, community. Um, so I felt it was, especially this year, important that I would be here with you, uh, listening to you, and thanks, Chris, for this um, comprehensive overview of what you are doing, the way in which you are leading the NRC. Um, I heard and I listened with, uh, with enormous interest, um, and I commend you for that. And I also have to say, as he mentioned in passing, um, just a few days ago, the, Internet, the IEA conference on effective regulatory uh, systems took place um, in the UAE, and you were uh, presiding there. Uh, that conference uh, honoring us uh, with, with your leadership uh, there in the way we do things in the IEA as a, as a real community, with us um, as the institution uh, uh, and you, our member states, um, uh, playing um, a, a, a parallel role uh, and together with us in, in this effort. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much and, congratulat and congratulations on, on, that, on that leadership. The uh, American regulatory community must be very proud of having you at the helm. Um, I think uh, these are, it is obvious, uh, these are incredibly challenging times. Um, so I, I want to um, focus in my uh, thoughts, my remarks uh, today on, on a few things uh, so you, you have an idea of how I'm seeing uh, them, how we from the IEA are looking uh, at them uh, from a global uh, perspective as an institution that has 176 uh, member states. So we are meeting at a time of great promise for the nuclear sector across all continents, policymakers and the public are turning to nuclear energy to mitigate climate change, ensure energy security, and deliver a just, reliable, affordable, and timely transition to a world of net zero carbon emissions. If ever there was a time to show up and step up as international organizations, regulators, policymakers, an industry that time, for me, is now. As I said, I will talk about 
two ways the IEA is doing just that. First, um, of course, it will not come as a surprise that I will give you an update about our work in Ukraine. Our Ukrainian friends are here. You recognize them. We're working with them, for them, supporting them every step of the way. For the first time, war is threatening the sites of a major nuclear power program. Secondly, I will talk about the IEA's efforts towards this future that the title of your conference is referring to. And here, I will focus on something some of you are already working on, and we will hear more about that in the course of the panel sessions, I suppose, and I'm talking about our uh, nuclear harmonization and standardization initiative, NESI, which is more than an initiative, is a way to respond to the moment, to this particular time, and to the opportunities that are opening in front of us. Over the past year, I have led six missions to Ukraine. We have crossed front lines and checkpoints and see firsthand the physical damage the war has caused at nuclear sites and the enormously challenging circumstances under which Ukrainian operators and regulators work. Very early in the war, we realized that the expert safety and security language every one of us here is so deeply familiar with was not good enough to describe exactly what was at stake to politicians and public now keenly aware of the dangers in Ukraine. War made it necessary to speak with laser precision about what really mattered. It was crucial to lay a foundation from which we could build clarity and trust, enlist support, and enact changes to reduce the threat of a nuclear accident. This is how the seven pillars of nuclear safety and security came to be. Physical integrity of facilities, reactors, fuel ponds, radioactive waste storage, must be maintained. Safety and security systems and equipment must be fully functional at all times. Operating staff must be able to fulfill their safety and security duties and have the capacity to make decisions free of undue pressure. Secure off-site power supply must be available from the grid for all nuclear sites. Logistical supply chains and transportation to and from the sites must function uninterrupted, effective on-site and off-site radiation monitoring systems and emergency preparedness and response measures must be present. Reliable communications with the regulator and others must be maintained. Seven fundamental safety pillars. Everyone, everyone of these concepts exists in our safety standards. So we haven't invented anything new. But all our communications regarding Ukraine and indeed our own analysis have been based on these pillars. After a year, even at this very fractured time, they have been accepted and not a single world had to be changed. I think when we look back, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will find this an important lessons, lesson of what an international, credible, and trusted community like the IEA, writ large, with member states, can do at a time of crisis, when clarity and speed are of the essence. The pillars themselves may have been accepted, but they have been violated. Over the past year, every one of these seven pillars of nuclear safety and security has been compromised. We have observed holes blown into buildings and into pipelines at nuclear power plants, daily off-site supply outages caused by shelling, and Ukrainian operators working under unimaginable stress. At one point, 
23rd and 24th November, Thanksgiving, here in the United States. Every, every single one of Ukraine nuclear power plants lost off-site power all at once. Can you imagine, can you imagine being an operator or regulator in such circumstances? Nothing is business as usual. At the IEA, our incident and emergency center has been operating continuously. Our safeguards teams have created clarity and diffused tensions by offering science and certainty amid the rhetoric of war. And the IEA has international teams of safety and security experts stationed at every Ukrainian nuclear power plant at the personal request of President Volodymyr Zelensky to me. They are there to assist, to observe, and to report, with the overall aim being to reduce the chance of an accident. Today, as it has been for the past months, the most serious situation is at Saporizhia, as Chris was reminding us. The plant on the front lines of war. Our teams report increased military operations that put the plant at risk, and the IAEA has been calling for the urgent implementation of a nuclear safety and security protection at the site. This is a conclusion we drew in September, and I will not stop my diplomatic efforts and my public appeals until it happens. Such a zone is in everyone's interest, but getting anything agreed when the two principal parties are at war with each other is not a straightforward endeavor. Nothing worthwhile is easy. As a diplomat and the director general of the IEA, it is my job not to shy away from hard things. It is my job to build platforms on which people can solve problems and grasp opportunities that really matter. That brings me to a look at the future. The IEA's Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, and what it matters, and why it matters. Its participants, thank God, may not be meeting in a wartime bunker, but ladies and gentlemen, the stakes are high. Every year, Wildfires are laying waste to communities across the world, from California to Australia. Floods are devastating lives from Pakistan to Germany. The world needs nuclear energy, and it knows it. Policymakers from South Korea to Brazil and from France to here in the United States are looking again at nuclear. And in many countries, public opinion polls are swinging in its favor. It is quite simple we will not reach net zero without nuclear, whether you ask the IEA experts or those of the International Energy Agency or those of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Investment in nuclear power and in advanced and small modular reactors will need to grow by multiples if countries around the world are to meet their economic and environmental goals. And investing is indeed coming. Governments, including, of course, here in the United States, are laying the groundwork. Private investment is growing. So the momentum seems to be here. The need is here. But will the new... A big part of the answer is here, in this room. The industry has done it once before, spurred by the oil shocks of the 1970s, which brought us many of the nuclear power plants we rely on today. But this time is different. The nuclear sector is not only growing, it's also changing. It's becoming much more global. An industry whose robust and effective regulatory requirements were developed when nuclear was largely a national endeavor are going to need to adapt. Even though we have international agreements like the IEA's safety standards and security guidelines, the way they are interpreted and applied can vary across the world. Bring into this reality the small modular reactors 
that can be built in a factory a thousand miles from where they will operate. And the benefit of harmonizing regulatory environments and standardizing industrial approaches becomes clear. Harmonization of the regulatory processes reduces uncertainty and helps to lower the cost of building and deploying SMRs. Harmonization of requirements facilitates international trade of SMRs and components as developers design and manufacture reactors that comply with a more uniform set of global standards rather than having to deal with multiple, sometimes even conflicting sets of requirements in different countries. Harmonization ensures SMRs across the world meet the highest safety and security standards, reducing the risk of accidents and the consequences of malicious acts, whether those reactors are deployed in the Netherlands or in Nigeria. This is particularly important given that they may be deployed in remote and vulnerable areas. Harmonized regulations help newcomer countries and those countries with less experience than the United States, fewer resources, and a smaller pool of the necessary talent. It allows them more easily to collaborate with others and implement the higher standards of safety and security. Harmonized regulations and requirements could also help streamline research and development efforts across different countries, promoting collaboration and knowledge sharing, and avoiding unnecessary duplication of efforts. In this hyper-connected world, consistent and sensible regulations developed with a consistent and honest engagement of all stakeholders could help foster also public trust and acceptance of new nuclear including SMRs for their deployment. And when it comes to the design of SMRs, working towards global standardization of approaches by developing generic user requirements, for example, could increase trade and create economies of scale for manufacturing, construction, and operation. By homing on on successful designs, operators and regulators become more familiar with the technology, leading to a greater understanding of potential risks and vulnerabilities. Several harmonization and standardization initiatives already exist. And this has been mentioned to me several times. The regulatory agencies of the United States, Canada, you were mentioning that, and Rumina is somewhere over there, uh, and the UK, are working together, as are some other European countries. Industry groups like the World Nuclear Association and international organizations like the Nuclear Energy Agency, built there, also have had working groups and extraordinary useful efforts looking at these issues. These are necessary. These are all very welcome. And we need them with us. But we need this at a global scale. Here is why NESI is different and why it is going to work at pace and with impact. It is the first truly global, global effort with wide international backing facilitated by the IEA. NESI brings together key stakeholders, including regulators and industry together. We have to talk to each other, not to preach to each other. And it is happening at the right time when the need and the momentum are here. Ladies and gentlemen, safety is at the heart of what the IEA does, whether it's building a safety culture across the globe, making sure the lessons of Chernobyl and Fukushima are learned and implemented, or applying its milestones approach to assist newcomer countries in developing the, reg the regulatory and safety infrastructure needed for a safe and secure nuclear power program. But NESI is not our initiative, it is yours the goals of NESI are not my goals. They are the goals of the regulators and industry representatives working in their separate tracks. Each track is asking, what do we need to do? What do we need the others to do? They are each defining their scope of work and identifying outputs. 
The regulatory track is focused on reducing barriers to information sharing, increasing collaboration between regulators when reviewing a reactor design, and determining how regulators can best leverage other reviews, how far we can go in this regard. It's for us to agree and decide. The industry track is working towards developing more standardized industrial approaches for SMR manufacturing, construction, and operations that can reduce license, licensing timelines, costs, and ultimately the time to actually deploy SMRs. Both tracks are running in parallel, and the IEA is facilitating coordination and communication between them, keeping everyone working together towards producing specific usable results by the end of next year. Ladies and gentlemen, the IEA, I like to say, never stops, not even for a single minute. We are determined to assist our member states when it comes to the use of nuclear technology in a safe manner. For many of them, SMRs and other new nuclear designs have the enormous potential to make a real difference in reducing energy poverty, fueling their economy, giving them the capacity and how important is this these days to have autonomous decisions, to face the energy security crisis in the best possible way. For many countries and communities across the world, power outages are a stark, constant, sad reality. Although the number of people without access to electricity has halved in the past 20 years, 770, 770 million people live without it. When I travel to Africa, to Asia, to Latin America, the Caribbean, achieving this fundamental necessity is a top national priority for many leaders I meet. And they ask about nuclear. They ask what nuclear, or if nuclear, can be there for them. It is possible, but some of the questions I have just laid out are important, and we need to solve them. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not sugarcoat it. You were saying rose-tinted glasses. We don't need those. We don't want those. This is going to be hard. It is going to be hard to set aside what we believe are our entitled rights and principles. It is going to be hard to continue working at war time. It is going to be hard to do all these things, bearing in mind that as a basis of this, a thriving private sector has to also be bringing um, the economic gains that we all need in the free world. But all of this requires you, requires us, because we are the place where this trust, where our societies can give us this indispensable trust. I like the title, Chris, of your conference, because it talks about the process of navigation. Your remarks were wisely sparkled with wise thoughts of Einstein and others. I also remember one from classic times where the Romans used to say that there are no good winds for those who do not know where they want to go. We know where we want to go. It's up to us. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. I'm Thank you very much. Really, um, I really appreciate that enormously. Can we let's start with Nessie uh, yeah. for a minute and. I appreciate very much the, the distinction that you made. Uh, I think um, 
uh, I want to make sure I have this right. The, the way in which uh, Nessie can kind of lift all boats. Yeah. Right? Um, but also recognizing that there are potentially separate, right? the, we can go a lot of places with the naval uh, analogies here, right? We're all in the same boat with regard to climate change, <laughs> but with regard to our individual regulatory schemes too, um, the word that gets thrown around a lot is kind of sovereignty and the need to maintain yes. that and so on yes. and so forth, right? And yet also there are opportunities um, I, and I want to recognize that our friend Ramsey Jamal from Canada often says a neutron is a neutron is a neutron, right? Yeah. <laughs> there are certain basic principles of engineering and physics that apply across the world. So talk about how, maybe you can talk for a minute about kind of how more uh, 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 developed countries potentially are, are interacting with Nessie and the potential than for others who are either coming up or considering nuclear or exploring that as a possibility to, um, uh, to improve their societies. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, this is a, an issue of what we could define as flexible geometries mm -hmm. here within an, an overarching uh, concept. Uh, it, is, it is clear that you have different degrees of maturity, institutional maturity, uh, regulatory experience. Um, and it is obvious as well that you may have, like you were describing, and I've seen this also in, in some existing European uh, uh, partnerships, mm -hmm. which are developing France with other Eastern European countries. Mm -hmm. All of that, all of that is possible and is compatible and it helps um, a global initiative, initiative like, like Nessie. The, what uh, we feel here is that we, what we need to do is to bring all these efforts together in, in a compatible way. It doesn't mean that you're going to be blurring um, national competences where they cannot be blurred. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is that we are going to be growing levels of convergence up to the um, high, highest point uh, possible, and we are going to be coexisting as well with uh, other initiatives. To put it in simple English, those who can run faster can do it, mm -hmm. and it is not a problem uh, having uh, systems that are uh, in a different level of compatibility. If you look at the uh, safety standards, and I think in the in the um, uh, nuclear regulatory experience, you, you have that. And we've created a working system where you have standards which um, are a, a common denominator that allow us to work as all in a, uh, I would say, coherent way. And it is obvious that you in the United States or other countries may have other uh, standards, sometimes more stringent, sometimes different, which coexist. What uh, we should set aside is this idea that it is all or nothing at all. Since you cannot have a NESI that is observed by all to the letter, then we can't, we can't have anything. And that is fundamentally wrong. And I think it doesn't do justice to the fine and noble nuclear regulatory tradition of having these flexible geometries, mm -hmm. which I think has been one of the most uh, remarkable uh, features of nuclear regulation over the years. So the challenge here is to move, to advance, to have ambition, and to push a little bit. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. The limits of what we can accept um, when leveraging uh, other countries' uh, regulatory experiences. And I'm sure that here, um, between the United States and Canada, there are partnerships that are so close that can allow for that uh, to happen. In Europe, it may also be the case. And the effect, um, uh, the e e example set by you, will be tremendously uh, positive for developing countries and for um, acceding countries. Yeah, yeah, thank you. 
So it makes sense that a lot of the conversation this morning, given that we're at the regulatory information conference, is on regulators. But the other half of the equation is on the industry and on and how Indeed. this idea kind of came out of, I think for you, out of the Group of Vienna. Yes. Uh, so talk for a minute about the importance of that well, that is exactly. This is what I meant when I said, well, we should not preach to each other. We should not be looking at what the others need to do. We should have a very clear view on what we need to do. And, and uh, in, in, in reality, I was inspired to, to go to, to, met, to Nessie and to try to move this forward, uh, ironically, out of conversations with industry and with CEOs that were complaining. They were complaining, maybe about you guys? I don't know. <laughs> Probably. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's possible. I don't know how just I Just another day at the I office. I don't know how, why I say this, but just you know, <laughs> crossed my mind. But, but n now, we, now we started the process. We, we have the working groups. And some of the homework for them is also emerging quite clearly. What, what are the areas where they need to be a bit more bold, a bit more open? And, and of course, here we have to understand that they have a different culture, which is nurtured by the principle of earn, earning money and, and competition, uh, healthy competition, of course. Uh, so uh, I think we are seeing, um, we are recognizing what their efforts uh, should be. And the good thing is that uh, in the logic of Nessie, we have this interface uh, so that nothing is excluded and we, we can have uh, this cross fertilization, if you want, um, uh, which is another way to say that we can spy on each other. Um, yes. No problem, it's authorized. <laughs> um, and we can work together and see what the, the regulator debate is doing and how they see, seeing from the perspective of an industrialist or a CEO, what, what they are saying, what they are complaining about, what the limitations are, and the industrial um, uh, family, so to speak, as well, to see uh, how is the, the regulatory family working towards this. Yeah, good. Yeah, thank you. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about this morning was, um, you know, Obviously, the, your efforts in Ukraine have, have um, received a, a lot of, of well-deserved attention. Yeah. And of course, uh, Nessie is, is something that as regulators we're out there talking about. But there are also these other big key pieces of the work of the agency, yes. particularly around um, uh, non-proliferation yes. and, um, uh, and, and um, Around the, the the safety and security of material sources and and um, working with non-weapon states. So, can you just talk a little bit about um, uh, um, you know the efforts that the IAEA is making on these things and maybe how they touch these other parts? You mentioned your safeguards inspectors in Ukraine. New reactor designs will have um, uh, security and safeguard uh, implications potentially, et cetera. Well, I think it's a time of, of great uh, transformation, yeah. I, I, I believe. Um, uh, when, when, when people talk about renaissance, not renaissance, I think um, we are not into that. We are into an industry that is there, that is growing, that is adapting to a new set of circumstances uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and this brings also uh, the, the, the need to adapt and to, to adjust. To adapt and to adjust that uh, to an industry that is going to be presenting uh, new products that will require a different approach also from the safeguards perspective and from the regulatory as we were saying as well because SMRs is just one mm -hmm. uh, of course uh, we are uh, zeroing in on something which is very visible and where money is flowing so projects are coming to maturity but there are a, a number a number of those and we need to make sure, because of the globality of the effort and my responsibility, we want to make sure that we lift uh, countries to the level that is required. There are many, many important, very important projects ongoing in, in countries that are not there yet. 
in terms of their uh, institutional maturity uh, and workforce. Uh, and here I recognize also your bilateral efforts with some countries that you are assisting. From the IEA side, I can tell you that the demand is huge. The demand is simply huge. Um, countries need it, they need it now, they want it now. And the answer can never be, we don't have time. We can never be that, please. So this is why I ask um, countries, and especially the, uh, the nuclear mm -hmm. uh, countries in this world, the 32 plus, the 50 plus, that are at the core of this to support us. Because uh, if we tell those looking at nuclear that we don't have time for them, that we don't have the resources to assist them, come later, come next month, uh, the opportunity will be lost. And it will be lost, I think, for a very long time. So um, this is why we are uh, devoting so, much, so many resources into, into training, into capacity building, into peer reviewing, into all this, um, these missions that uh, are dispersed uh, all over the world. Uh, but of course, um, uh, we are challenged and, and we, in, in a good way, I would say, by, by Ukraine uh, and what happens there. And we are devoting, of course, uh, lots of resources and time and energy as, and as it should be. Uh, to this, uh, but it, it, it is obvious uh, that an agency that has such a small budget um, has enormous difficulties. <laughs> and this is why countries like the United States are trying to support us through extra budgetary contributions so that we can do uh, what we need to do. But we, when you look at the mission we have, the responsibility we have, uh, when you look at our workforce and the means that we have to do it, uh, I think it, there's a big discrepancy. Of course, we need to be realistic um, uh, and not dream about things that are impossible to achieve in terms of a growing capacity for the agency. But simply to say that uh, all the support we get uh, is indispensable and we are motivated and ready to, to take up the task. Thank you. I think I, the the, the prospect of expanded nuclear energy is yeah. really important. But I think uh, you and I both share a, a, a passion for uh, supporting developing countries in the use, peaceful uses yes. of radioactive materials. Yes. You've had uh, the Rays of Hope initiative, Race the, of Hope. the New Tech Plastics initiative. Um, I, it was a great, uh, I, 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 uh, I really enjoyed at the conference in Abu Dhabi with Steve Burns, hopefully highlighting some of that. Again, the capacity building, yes. Yes. you know, the effort to build um, and, and, and support um, technically competent independent regulators. But just for our audience here, talk for a minute about all of you know, these other things that are yeah. really, they're supporting sustainable development goals, they're important for human health uh, and, and, and economics, et cetera. You know, the Thanks for, for, for asking this, because sometimes it's, it's an issue that, is especially in, 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 in uh, places of nuclear excellence like this, are a little bit forgotten. Um, and the reality is that from my 176 member states, the vast majority is in not for the non-proliferation. Of course, they respect it. They need something else. They need help. And the good thing about us, nuclear, is that we are about concrete things. One of the things that, that as head of an international organization happens to me is that sometimes, to my great frustration, uh, I participate in fora and in places where there is so much blah, blah. So much when it comes to development goals, when it comes to gender when it comes to uh, you know, human health. We, in the nuclear, and it includes us all, we are about very concrete things. When we talk about um, human health, well, where is it that we excel? Nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, mm -hmm. rays of hope. Mm -hmm. And we are 
providing radiotherapy services in many places that did not have a single, can you imagine, a single simple cobalt-60 radiotherapy unit in countries, all right? 75% of Africans don't have any access to any, any at all. You have a cancer, you die. Very simple. So this is, this is what nuclear brings. People talk about um, ocean ma maritime problems. Well, we have isotopic hydrology problems. And you know, next week, there is one of these big conferences, the UN, uh, ocean conferences. And we go there not with a speech. We go there to set up the global, the global network of water laboratories in the world. So we are the guys who are looking into the problem that you have in your waters, in sediment, or in fish. We are giving uh, policymakers the tools to solve the problems. And the same goes to plastics, where uh, we can, uh, through um, irradiation technologies, we can solve the problems, and so on. So I believe that one of the things, and this, is, this has been one of my, um, uh, I would say, inspiring um, uh, and, and more, uh, I would say, pressing uh, forces driving me in my first uh, term of office, is to use this formidable tool. The IEA is that, is a tool to its potential. And I think there's, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot uh, we can do there. With five million US, five million US dollars, I can build a radiotherapy center in a country, in a small African country, and make the mortality rate drop by 50%. How about that? How about that? And this is possible. This is really possible. And this, this was not being done. This was not being done. A few months ago, President Biden had this vision of the Africa summit here in Washington and committed 55 billion only on health issues. It's much more when you look at the package. And I need 5 billion to go to the Central African Republic, 0 0.000000 of what the United States is already giving. So I think we must do this. We must take this seriously. And, and, and we must realize that we are privileged, that we in nuclear have this ability to improve the conditions of so many around the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think from the United States, one of the things that I've appreciated about the way you approach this is, you called it flexible geometries earlier, and or maybe alternate geometries, where uh, you can go into these uh, uh, countries and with with five million dollars and 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 do a lot of good and and sometimes the United States can too from various mechanisms not you know not always the NRC we're focused more on the regulatory capacity building but we can work with the countries uh, who have influence in some of these places yes. right we can support Argentina Morocco uh, you know other places that are leaders in their in their regions where they're the ones who are doing the most work and could use some support from us. So that it's not, a, it's not always a you know, big country swooping in to do X, X, Y, or Z, but we can help the multilateral organizations. We can create these uh, formal and in informal frameworks that I think are so important to making progress on these issues. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, it's so heartwarming to see how consistently the United States is the number one extra budgetary uh, contributor. And we have the ambassador here. Thank you, ambassador, again for, for that. But you know what? We need much more. <laughs> uh, so keep doing that, do it, but do it, do it more. And, and there are in the room regulators from, from industrialized nations. And with a tiny bit, we can do so much. And the nuclear guys, as I was saying, are the guys of the concrete solutions, fast, each taxpayer's dollar that comes to the IEA goes immediately to a lab uh, somewhere. We are not creating positions or offices or special representatives. What we are doing is um, science, 
technology for, uh, for this. So thank you for that. Thank you. Well, Raphael, thank you so much thank for you. spending your time with us this morning. Thank you it very much. It has been much. a great pleasure uh, to have you here at the RIC. Um, uh, I wish you uh, all the best for your time here in Washington and, uh, and, and look forward um, to seeing you soon. Thank you to everyone uh, who submitted questions on the app. I hope we covered a lot of those things yes. um, uh, in terms of the answers about industry and about the NRC and other things um, that we can be doing. It's, uh, it's, you, it's a great I, I pleasure really to have you. It. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, my friend.